new and rising superwoman, Karen White. But first, and just arrived back in this country, you saw them here first, folks. Two young people who spent months on a remote, uninhabited, and indeed uninhibited Pacific island. They were following in the footsteps, probably the footstep, of Robinson Crusoe, or perhaps Blue Lagoon. For years, this man nursed and pursued an impossible dream to live in idyllic solitude on a desert island with a sole female companion. Just the way I feel every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. <laughs> and he fulfilled his dream. And after months on the Micronesian island of Darren Lang, he's back. Was it sheer heaven or hell? Well, let's ask Martin Popplewell and his girl Friday, Rachel Stevens. I'll ask you first, Martin, how did you... Well, welcome back, both Thank of you. you. That's the first thing <laughs> to say. You, look, you both look unmarked. I've got them covered up. Have you? Yes. <laughs> I cover mine up as well. <laughs> I was going to say, are you surprised? Are you talking? Because the papers had it that you weren't. That's right. Actually, we're not supposed to be talking for several weeks. Oh, I see. We broke the embargo, especially for your program. Mm. But you'll go back to silence to each other That's when right. this is as over. As soon as possible, we're stepping out. That's grand. Not before, before the program is over, That's please. Right. Okay. We promise. <laughs> How about finding the island? What, what kind of criteria did you use to find your desert island? Well, I basically wrote to virtually every government in the South Pacific, just asking if they could provide me with an island. Um, essentially, I, really, I was looking for one with as many commodities um, like fresh water and things like that but those kind of islands don't tend to be uninhabited so we were just basically looking for an island which was uninhabited but isn't this the point about a desert island if it's uninhabited the reason is because nobody can live on it that's the whole point <laughs> that's the trouble when you, you write to these people and say yes we've got an island it tends to be very bare on what they what commodities it has i mean they tend to be without and it fresh. was wasn't it it was very where did you end up we ended up first was, uh, the first island was actually much better because it, it was closer to the in inhabited island of Mogmog. Mog. They used it like a garden. Mog, Mog. This was Chagalag or something, didn't it? Oh, sorry? Tagalag. <laughs> Patongros. Patongros. <laughs> Close. <laughs> Close. Now, when I talked to you, the last time I spoke to you, we were thousands of miles apart on the, on the other end of a transcontinental phone line. Mm. And the first lady who'd been with you had left. Yeah. Possibly because of something you said. <laughs> Now, this is the thing, there was this big ooh-ah that Helen had left, but I, th I think most people are aware that I had only met her for six weeks before we actually went away. Now, when you consider the chances of that relationship, if you like, working out, anyone walking down the street, what I essentially had to do is advertise, walk down the street, meet someone, and the chances of it actually working out, really are 100 to 1. So we were both trying, we failed. I don't think it's such a terrible thing to say about our two personalities that we didn't hit it off because we hardly knew one another. It wasn't necessarily all that though. I mean, she suffered a great deal from mosquito bites and all the rest, didn't That's she? That's right. It, it, it was much, in a way, much tougher on the first island because we had all these problems with mosquitoes. But then on the second island, we were much further away. So it was much more stressful on the emotional side and the, the worry, worrying side on the, the second on the, island. On the second island? Yes, because we, were, we were, were much further away. Was this you and, and Rachel? That's correct. So that was a more stressful emotional thing? Definitely. <laughs> Even though it worked out better. You get surprised. <laughs> no, no I, you shook your head when he was nodding his. But, um, <laughs> I mean, you'd, would you agree? I don't know, I wasn't there for the first time. But the second <laughs> island, yes, the second island was quite enough, was it? Certainly for me, yes. But it was also incredibly enjoyable. But what <laughs> made you go when you saw that, that the first girl had had such a rough time, went emotionally, yeah. you know, physically? What made you want to go? Um, I was a lot luckier than Helen. Sorry, my voice is going. One of, one of the many diseases I brought back with me. Really? Um, <laughs> 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 Yeah. Um, in that I was only to go out for two months, yeah. so I could always see, <laughs> I could always see the end of the, my time there. Um, also, I knew Martin for two years. But what did your I went parents out. think when you said I'm going out to this desert island um, with this fella? I think it was shock at first, um, but they talked things through with me and eventually realised I was going to do this or some other mad thing. So they supported me extremely well through. You, <clears throat> I think the first girl who was with Helen had a, a rough time because. When she went to go for a swim, the sea was full of sharks. Mm. And when they went in to sleep at night, there were rats running all over. Now you, <laughs> it's enough to put many people off, you um, 
Well, different, Rachel, because you were a student of zoology, you quite enjoyed the rats. <laughs> Unfortunately, there weren't any rats on our oh, island. It's quite disappointing, disappointing really, yeah. yeah. Were, there, were there creepy, crawly things you could take an interest in? There were certainly creepy, crawly things. Yeah. Well, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. It's a cheap shot, wasn't it? I know. <laughs> what about, about the sharks, though? The sea was still there were certainly shark. sharks around, but it's really disappointing. Um, we both were trying to ha see as many as we can, but chasing enough to see off the sharks swam rather quickly. We just couldn't get close enough to look at them properly. You're so. really disappointing. It was. <laughs> <laughs> and then, if I may introduce the, the vexed subject, which of course is what everybody watching is going to want to know about, mm -hmm. sex. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't any. That's what we're telling you. No, it's true. <laughs> no, it, yeah, but we, we had like sorted out our ground rules and arrangements. I mean, Rachel said none, and I agree to that. <laughs> so it wasn't as bad as perhaps people would imagine. It was but pretty I mean, bad. You don't but... think it was a contributory factor to any abrasion? I mean, you must have disagreed and fought with each other. Arguments were really on other things completely, mm. weren't they? But you so don't think the fact that there was no sex created a kind of abrasion, a kind of Not antipathy at all. between I really wouldn't I say think that. If anything, sex would have made things more temperamental and more yeah. Potentially argument because I'm not sure I'd agree with that. But <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's have an argument now. <laughs> but, actually, yeah. but certainly it, they, they never cropped in in the way that people would perhaps imagine because we'd agreed, we'd said that mm. that wasn't expected. Therefore, if, if we'd gone out there with more of a, a possible, then perhaps it would have cropped did in. Did you more. think or did it work out to be tougher than you thought it was going to be? No. no. It worked out more or less as I imagined it. What about you, Red? Only. I, I was ill for the first time when I was out there and it was only during that time that it was tough because it really um, pointed out to me how remote and kind of like basically <laughs> how much remoteness really does affect you. We have a little uh, film that you made, mm. I think, uh, while you were there on the, on the island. Right, that, that's an aerial shot of the island we're seeing right now. Yeah. Um, it's the one, I'm trying to work out what angle, oh, that's gone now, but this is our island. Um, it's like but it looks seen. idyllic, doesn't it? It looks beautiful. It, it was. is. It was. Very, very beautiful. Yes, yes. <laughs> we had an idyllic time, really. But from all I've read, it was terrible. This Rachel has now got hold of a, a <laughs> coconut palm and is, I think, I'm not sure how much we're going to see, but she's weaving it essentially to build thatch for the, the roof of that. Oh no, I'm weaving it now. Yeah. Right, I'm leaving. Where's Sue Lolly? <laughs> <laughs> this is weaving the thatch to, to put on the roof for thatch to, to keep out the water or attempt to keep out the oh, water. Oh, I do admire you. Look at that. That's the house. The bus station. <laughs> <laughs> Once we built the house that we had this little cat we'd taken, it dashed in and thought we'd build a big potty for it and tried to go to the toilet right in the middle. It got kicked out pretty quick. What about, what about it looks a terrific. Uh, building. I mean, you've done very, very well. What did you kind of, what did you live on? What did you eat? I ate a lot of coconut crabs, um, which are... Uh, but that, you're a vegetarian. I was before I went out. Um, <laughs> confused <laughs> it, vegetarian. Yeah, confused vegetarian. Now, when I went out there, I decided that I was going to live off the land. And of course, I could have lived vegetarianism off the land. But it was important for me to, to take every food for Rachel resource. did. I mean, were you... You offended that, that he, he didn't stick with the vegetarianism? You're no, not at all, because he had his principles and I had mine. So. But, I mean, were you more ill than he was? Unfortunately, yes. Do you think that was, be <laughs> do you think that was because you were sticking to the vegetarian diet? Um, because it didn't give you enough protein, surely, on a desert island. No, it didn't at first, and I was basically beginning to fall to bits. <laughs> Luckily, we found an um, island nearby called Lam, and we swam across to there and found some breadfruit nuts, which were then a brilliant source of protein for me. Is so. this a naive question? If one or the other of you had become suddenly seriously ill, mm -hmm. what was to prevent one or the other of you dying without proper health? Not well, much. yeah, not much. That's what really brought home to it when I, when I did get so ill, that it was a, a, a real possible event. Yeah, I mean, when it's all going well, it's lovely and it's yeah, beautiful scenes and you think, so. uh, oh, nothing can possibly go wrong. But the, when Rachel got ill and one morning she was having such difficulty breathing, that's when it becomes home to you just how f far away help is and what a potentially dangerous situation you're in. That's when it really comes home. What about adjusting to life since you've come back? It's <laughs> been incredibly easy. The only, this is something which I've noticed, that being at home, news comes in so often, you hear of so many hundred people dying here, thousands dying there, and you t take on a very clinical attitude towards it all. Now, when I was coming back in the car, my parents were filling me in on what happened to China, and I'm not sure whether it was hundreds or, or a thousand or tens of thousands. In Tiananmen Square. Yeah, I nearly cried. 
And that, I think, really showed up how hardened you become here. I mean, you're still shocked and abhorrent to what's happened, but when you're away from it for so long, that, that your clinical reaction to it is put to one side and mm. it, it affects you on much more of a human level. Anybody say to you you've changed or it has changed you? Rachel? Not really. I don't think we've been back long enough for real changes to notice. I mean, there are initial things like when I worked in, um, walked into the first civilised house, I immediately sat on the floor and just looked at the seats and things like that. Um, and cried when I saw all the food laid on the table, but that was only real initial stuff. It was just sheer amazement, kind of like the real luxury we have, but yeah. long-term changes I think we've yet to discover. So. Look, thank you both for joining us. Stay with us, please. Thank Terry. You. Yes, ma'am. We have a present for you. This oh. is a coconut <laughs> from our island. Don't eat it. We had from, real problems from getting... And the island's called... Through Drolling. customs. <laughs> Throling. 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 It means edge of the horizon. And we had great problems taking that through customs. They thought we had cannabis in it, and goodness knows what else. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's lies. Nice. I hope it's got some rum in it. <laughs> anyway, thank you both. Thank nice you. to talk to you. Martin and Rachel. Uh, stay with us, Martin and Rachel, because I'm going to seek expert opinion on your exploits from a man who's climbed every mountain, forded every stream. Lieutenant Colonel John Blashford Snell. <laughs> As Blashers, a great adventurer. Um, and you brought your coconut on as well, didn't you? You might run out of food, I mean. Uh, quite, quite. <laughs> well, we won't starve for this evening, anyway. Well, a very dangerous undertaking, would you say? It's difficult to say. I mean, they were obviously reasonably well prepared, and some of the things that they did, uh, although they might excite us back here, because if you're going to an island which is uninhabited, it's probably uninhabited for a jolly good reason, whether That's it be rats saying. or snakes or something else, or lack of food. But um, on the other hand, if you're sensible and you take a few precautions and you have a little bit of training and preparation before you go, then I wouldn't say it necessarily is too dangerous. Well, what kind of um, preparations did you make? You, you went up to the, the Hebrides or somewhere? Yeah, I, I spent a 10-day period on, the, on a Hebridean uninhabited, uninhabited island. That was purely psychological test. But I did speak to lots of experts, not to the colonel himself, yeah. but to many people. I mean, would Lucy Irvin among others. Would that be adequate, do you think, for survival? It could well be. I, I think if you're going to that island, I haven't been to Yap, I've been to some further south. Uh, obviously, one of the things you'd want to find out about are these cone shells and things in the sea, which can uh, inject you with a pretty deadly poison when you see a rather nice, attractive shell and you pick it up and lo and behold, you've got a dart in your finger, which can kill you in a few seconds. I um, mean, that's something that would be useful to know about. I doubt so that they had any snakes on their island. Um, but then there are things off the Australian coast like box jellyfish and blue octopus and they, those can give pretty fatal bites. But the, the tropics are lethal. <laughs> yes, but so is some parts, so are some parts of England. I mean, <laughs> I had a couple, a couple of Eskimos with me the other day who fled in terror when they were going down the King's Road because they suddenly saw a monster racing towards them and it was a double-decker bus. <laughs> <laughs> yes, everything is relative, I suppose. Um, Martin was influenced by Blue Lagoon which is, gave him the romantic idea of going out to a blue lagoon of his own. Um, and one sees a lot of adverts for, for chocolate bars, which make desert islands extremely desirable, since they seem to be full of lovely ladies and all the rest of it. Do you think this is going to... And particularly... Not well, quite. Particularly, <laughs> particularly Martin and Rachel's experience. Might this encourage a lot of people to rush off and, and, and land on a desert island and starve to death? Well, I know a bit about Blue Lagoon because our ship on Operation Drake was used in the making of the film. And uh, it was the one at the beginning which catches fire and then maroons those two youngsters. Um, it might, but I, I, I think that uh, most governments, of course, who own islands are a little cautious, as indeed Martin found out, about letting people come. And the Australian government in particular gave Lucy Irving quite a hard time about getting onto her island, uh, Tuan, off the north coast of mm. Australia. Have you any experience yourself with desert islands? Yes, I've been on a number. In fact, I was on one a few years ago, not so very far from where they are, uh, where we were studying traditional medicine, which is another thing you could look into. And I always remember that, because when we had these youngsters there from Operation Rally, we were talking to the locals about what they used to cure various ailments. And at the end of a very long and tiring day, in which everything that they said had to be translated about five times, the professor, who was an Australian working at the local university, said to the old chief, do you have the contraceptive plant? And there is such a thing, I'm not kidding you, this is absolutely true. And they said, yes, we have, we have the contraceptive plant. So then the professor said, well, how do you use it? Where do you get it from? 
Oh, they said, and I'm just taking it literally, because it took several hours to get this. We send the finest warriors across the sea full of sharks and over the river full of everything else, crocodiles, past the hostile natives, up a tree, where at midnight, at the height of the full moon, you find a bush covered in thorns, and you must get right to the top, and there are some very rare leaves, which you must baste in honey taken from the wild bees' nest, and then get back to the island past the snakes and the crocodile. <laughs> this took another two or three hours. And finally, you hand over the leaves to the chief. And the professor, who was getting pretty tetchy by now, said, well, come on, come on. He said, how do you apply it? Is it an infusion? Do you boil it? Do you eat it? No, said the chief. We line up all the most beautiful ladies in the tribe, and we give them each one leaf, and we order them to grip it between their knees. <laughs> that is absolutely... Now that is absolutely Get terrible. away. <laughs> you just made that one up. <laughs> I was there when it happened. And, and you know, these Papua New Guineans rolled around in the sand in mirth. And the trouble was, a lot of these professors didn't think it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> when you go out like that, I mean, should they have brought some things to placate the natives? I mean, were the natives friendly, Martin? Yeah, very much so. They were, they were very warm, gentle, great people. They really were nice. And did you have the privacy that you hoped for? On the second island, definitely. On the first island, we were something of a tourist attraction. The word got around Ulithi that, that, that there's these crazy Westerners living on this island, and they used to turn up in about 20 people in a boatload, appearing on the island, and then come on the pretense of collecting coconuts, visit us, and so we didn't get the privacy we wanted on the first <laughs> island. I was, I was asking the two of them about returning to civilization. Do, do you find that hard to cope yes, with? Yes, we tell the rally venturers that they're yes. going to suffer from this terrible disease when they get back of post-expedition blues. And the best way to overcome it is to hurl themselves all the vigor and energy they can into helping other people or running their own expeditions. And we get a lot of them who come back on the selection weekends and act as staff, and we get some who run expeditions for the disabled. We had one girl from Hampshire the other day who took some blind people up Mount Kinabalu in Malaysia. And so we've, I would say to any young person coming back from an expedition, when they will find that although they've changed, the world hasn't and they've got this awful business of facing nine yeah. to five or whatever. The best thing is to just throw yourself into helping someone else, doing something for the community, doing some community work, and generally getting yourself so busy that you forget how that it's possible to be bored. I forgot to ask you, Martin, now, Rachel, would you go back? Yes, but I enjoyed it very, very much, enough to go back. But life is all about experiences, and I have many, many things that I want to do. And going on that kind of trip is it's a, a time-consuming business. So um, there would have to be extenuating circumstances where, I don't know, if, if something terrible happened in the family, where I wanted to get away from it all to go back. Um, I wouldn't do it. I know what it's like, and so I don't need to experience that again. Rachel, would you go back? Um, no, but not through any aversion to anything that happened on the island. It's for exactly the same reasons as Martin yeah. said. I mean, there's just... A whole wide world out there, all to be experienced. But I mean, maybe you've experienced the most exciting thing you're ever going to experience, and you're, you're only how old? 19? 19, yes. No, I think. How can you top it? I... <laughs> you you Did you do a lot of that in the island, saying, no, you first? <laughs> <laughs> you're still happy, aren't you? Yeah. Right, okay. Right. No, um, I was a question, I've forgotten. Oh. <laughs> It has had its mark on you, being retired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, how can you top the trip? How, where, where, what can you As do Rachel, that's I think, yeah, said, there's lots and lots of exciting things to do. I mean... It's just different experiences. Yeah, different types of experience. Yeah, exactly. Well, I hope you experience them all. I think you're, you're both remarkable. And old blasters, it's good to see. What, what are you, what's that uh, stick? Well, this is a thing I was going to recommend if I go back. Yes. It's for bonking down uh, <laughs> things like coconuts. And you've got an extendable one there, so very good for hitting coconuts. <laughs> right, a tremendous <laughs> idea. And if you actually want to open yeah. your coconut, then you undo the ferrule at the end, and you've got a rather nice spike, which is very good for picking up the flotsam and jetsam that people leave. Yeah. And then, you like to hold that, Martin? Of course, steady, look out flat. On the floor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we no. haven't rehearsed this now. No. no. Ow! <laughs> Done? No, I'm another yeah. go. Have another go. <laughs> <laughs> do, you have, do you have a couple of hours? <laughs> Look, I'll tell you what, while you're doing this, thanks very much for the moment to, Mr. <laughs> to the Colonel Blashford Snell and to Martin. <laughs> Drink. Drink? I'm not going to catch you, Anthea. <laughs> Thank you.
delicious. Well, that's 90% proof. <laughs>